And Copernicus's book is full of clues that hints at other past sources. And though Al Batani is the only Islamic astronomer Copernicus actually names, recent detective work has uncovered clues that Copernicus based many of his ideas on the work of other Islamic scholars. The clearest example is Copernicus's use of a mathematical idea devised by the 13th century Islamic astronomer Al Tusi, called the Tusi couple. Back in England, I compared a copy of Al Tusi's Tezkira fi Ilm al Hayya with another edition of Copernicus's Revolutionibus. In it, there's a diagram of the Tusi couple, and there's an almost identical diagram in Copernicus's book, even down to the letters that mark the points on the circles. So in El Tuzi, there's the Arabic Elif, which is A. There's the Ba, which is B. The Jim over here is the G. And the Dal at the center, D. It's a remarkable similarity. Now, this might just be coincidence, but it's pretty compelling evidence. In fact, I truly believe that Copernicus must have been aware of Al Tuzi's work and other Islamic astronomers. The top of this mountain in northern Iran was the adopted home of the man who was the next of Copernicus's Islamic influences, Nasruddin al Tusi. He would succeed in rewriting Ptolemy's theory, which would ultimately lead to the overthrow of the geocentric view of the universe, and so the birth of the modern scientific age. This is the remote castle of Alamut, Al Tusi's adopted home. For many years, it was the home of a Muslim sect called the Ismailis. It's a lovely secluded spot, and it was the center of the Ismaili movement. It's not surprising that Al Tusi would find a home here. And it wasn't just him. Many other scholars were gathered here, and there seems to have been a library. It was a, a, a center for learning, as well as a, a military stronghold. Here, this is the main gate, northern gate, of the upper castle of Hassan Sabo. A new archaeological dig is now revealing under the castle hewn into the living rock, a warren of rooms and studies, a mosque and living quarters for this extraordinary community of soldiers and scientists. This is the court of uh, mosque or uh, center of uh, headquarters uh, of castle. And it was within these cramped conditions that El Tusi started his masterwork of the Shukuk, or the doubts, the Tezkira. In it, he finds an answer to Ibn al-Haytham's first challenge, how to eliminate Ptolemy's equant. Instead of a sphere rotating around an arbitrary point in space, al tusi devised a series of two nested circles which rotate around each other in such a way that they eliminate the equant. The nested circles became known as a Tusi couple. This is the mathematical system that finds its way into Copernicus's work some 300 years later. Having found a solution to the equence problem, Al Tusi now wanted to complete the task Ibn al Haytham had started 200 years earlier to find a consistent mathematical description of the movement of the celestial bodies. But to do that, he needed better data, which meant bigger and better equipment than he was ever going to find here at Alamut. 
And then something happened which changed El Tusi's life forever. The Mongols. <laughs> Streaming in from the east, an army of Mongols led by Haluga Khan marched into Iran, crushing everything before them. By 1255, they had reached the foothills of Alamut, intent on its destruction. Then, in a brilliant piece of diplomacy, Al Tusi managed to both save his own skin and satisfy his scientific ambition. He visited the Mongol leader and played on his deep astrological superstition. Convincing him he could tell the future if only he had new equipment, Al Tusi persuaded the Khan to make him his head scientist and to build him just a few hundred miles away, perched on a hilltop where the air was clear, the largest observatory the world had ever seen. This is all that remains of the Maraga Observatory. The main instrument is hidden under this protective dome. Al Tusi's new astronomical center was based around a single large building. Inside was an enormous metal arc, an armillary arm, 10 meters across. On its circumference were marked angles in degrees and minutes. The scientists would line up the celestial object under study with a central point on the arc, and then make a reading from the markings on the arc, giving them the definitive, accurate position of the object in the sky. The building was also surrounded by smaller astronomical equipment, libraries, offices and accommodation. The observatory even had its own dedicated mosque. I suppose it is a little disappointing that there's not that much left of the place now. So you really have to imagine what it must have been like back in its heyday. After all, what Al Tursi built here was nothing less than the world's greatest observatory for 300 years. And like any modern day uh, international research institute, he brought together the world's greatest astronomers from as far away as Morocco and, and even China. I mean, it must have been a really great buzzing atmosphere to work here. With his new observatory and world-class team, Al Tusi was now ready to fulfill Ibn al-Haytham's dream, to try to make Ptolemy's model scientifically rigorous. First, they attacked the mathematics. As well as the Tusi couple, they invented other systems of planetary movement. And with these new systems, they were able to calculate mathematically consistent models for many of the celestial bodies. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the Sun and Moon. Al Tusi and the astronomers he brought together created what became known as the Maragha Revolution, which was a complete paradigm shift in astronomy, overthrowing the old Ptolemaic view. What Islamic scholars and astronomers like Al-Tusi do is to organize and make sense of mathematical astronomy at a level of unprecedented accuracy, using instruments more precise than had been built before, over longer timescales with predictions of the positions of planets and stars that no one had previously reached, that at Miraga or at Alamut, we see, I think, genuine revolutions in the level, scale, and intensity of mathematical astronomy. But there was still a problem. The new models were mathematically coherent 
and they dispensed with Ptolemy's unwieldy equant. But they still firmly placed the Earth at the centre of the universe, and that inevitably meant that their descriptions of the heavens were intricate and complicated, with epicycles, deference and couples. It was like some great cosmic gearbox.